Welcome to the latest Iris Prize podcast. We love everything queer in the world of film and this year we're celebrating Best of British. My name's Lucy Smith and I'm here today with Matt Mahmood Ogston, whose film My God I'm Queer has been shortlisted for the 2020 Iris Prize Best British Shorts, supported by Film 4. We have a package of services for their next film sponsored by Pinewood Studios Group. And all 15 shortlisted films will have a UK-wide audience through Film 4 on all four. So your film, My God, I'm Queer, um, tackles quite a powerful message. You're exploring the very tough issue of whether the suicide of your fiancé Naz could have been prevented with more positive Muslim LGBT plus role models. And in general seems to sort of be tackling how can we normalise love in all con- in all contexts, in all, in all consequences. Um, my first question is... You've got so many people working on this film. You found so many contributors. How did you go about putting this film together from the ideas to finding people? How did it all piece together? Well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, the, the, I wanted to make a film um, that could be shown on an event we were holding to a memorial event to remember Naz because um, uh, in Last year it was um, going to be five years since my fiance sadly took his own life, and I wanted to have a have a a document, a film, something where not only could we all remember Naz, but also to use his the positive energy that he had to actually try and create some change. And yeah. it really was just a it just started with a feeling that I wanted to do that, but not having made a documentary before. I was kind of a bit stuck, you know, I knew how to use a camera, I knew I could use some editing software, but in terms of actually putting it together into something kind of robust, um, I really needed a bit of help. And um, along that journey, just when I was playing around with some ideas, I met for the first time uh, Mira Mystery, my producer, and um, she said she wanted to make a film. And I said, I wanted to make a film. So we said, let's make the film together. And that's when it started. And um, because of the charity work that I do with my charity, Nazimat Foundation, um, we were um, lucky in this regards to be able to already have contact and even friends who were from um, the LGBTQ plus um, queer Muslim community who we could reach out and ask to see if they wanted to get involved. And also... Um, the in actual fact, the part of the early part of the film where we interview Manny, um, you know, he was actually working with our charity at the beginning because um, he reached out to us and asked for some support. So oh, we'd already filmed his interview, um, wanting to do something with it, but not having uh, the kind of the platform in order to kind of show it really. Um, okay. So, it's, so yeah. it's a really organic project. Lovely, yeah, because you do get quite up close and personal with Manny's life in particular. Yeah, so that's really interesting. That's the relationship. Yes. I'll be asking more about your charity later. Um, but yeah, just to, just to be clear, so you weren't a filmmaker before. This was completely a project brought together by others who came and helped you sort of channel it into a film. Is that right? Or? Kind of. I mean, I... I actually, my degree is actually in video production, but that okay. was um, over 20 years ago. I know okay. I don't look it, um, <laughs> but it was over 20 years ago. And when I left the university, um, having qualified to be able to, you know, make films, um, the, that was when the internet was just coming out. And the internet seemed very exciting. And there were lots of jobs in the internet, whereas where I'm from in Birmingham, there were not lots of jobs for filmmakers and I thought well let me just see what this internet thing is and I did internet work for 20 years but all during that time I wanted to make films but I never really had the courage okay. um, and confidence to actually do that and Naz my late fiance he always wanted me to make films um, but he couldn't push me he couldn't he, he, he just wanted me to find that place to be able to make films um, when it was appropriate to do so and when Naz sadly passed away I began to lose interest in in life um, you know because I almost took my own life um, soon after he passed away and losing interest in everything around me I didn't want to essentially do anything and then it kind of 
slowly began to kind of fall into my mind and into, I guess, my heart, really, that I have to do something to try and stop this from happening again. And if the charity work that I'm doing is is helping in some way, then how can I use the thing that I've always wanted to do, which is to make films? Why don't I now, for once in my life, have the confidence to do something that I've always wanted to do? And I just kind of try to go for it. Yeah, do you feel that film as opposed to things like outreach work and stuff like that is there something that film can do that other things can't to sort of maybe make people feel less alone or spread some sort of message do you do you feel that working absolutely i think um you know outreach work and support work um versus filmmaking in in some ways they're very much the same thing in terms of because i do public speaking and stuff for the charity as well and what i've always found really difficult with with speaking to people is that you might fill a room there might be 300 people in the room that you speak to and 300 room 300 people in a room is really important and you can speak to those in a really intimate way but how can we amplify that and get our message of unconditional love from parents how do we get that message out to more than 300 people in a go and how do we convey that message to individuals who could never come to one of our talks how do we get our message out to people who are perhaps trapped in their own family environment where perhaps they're not allowed out very much they certainly wouldn't consider going to an lgbt group or an event where there's a speaker talking about lgbt stuff so by by using filmmaking as a process we can actually create things that can reach individuals who may never know that help exists and i think even more importantly than that they can reach individuals who fear that or think that they're the only one in their situation yeah it's almost even though it's a bigger audience it's almost more intimate because someone can watch this alone and just yeah and it's a very intimate experience going through these stories in the film um that kind of brings me to my next question what the more film I watch about LGBT plus issues, um, the more it almost feels like it's expected for queer people to tell their coming out story, which um, it's almost become normalized because everyone does it. Um, I was wondering if you feel that there's a chance of, can it ever feel desensitized? Like there's just too many stories of people's often painful and very complicated journeys of coming out. Um, but it's almost expected as a queer person to just say them. Um, do you, or did you always approach things with fresh eyes? Did did you feel that, like, was it one or the other? I think I understand what you're saying. It's um, yeah. <laughs> you know, for so the so so our charity has been running since 2014, and uh, apart from support and outreach work, um, a lot of the work that we do is sharing our story and the one thing that I've learned um, is that sharing the same story on different platforms in different ways to different audiences using different media types using different formats is incredibly important because some people respond to a podcast some people respond to a film some people respond to a poem some people respond to a book or some people respond to a talk and being able to harness our own stories and be able to tell our stories in unique ways that connect to the audience that you're now speaking to Mm -hmm. is an incredibly important skill for people to learn. And I think for individuals who may be just sick and tired of hearing coming out stories, or maybe you're the privileged person who doesn't need to listen to coming out stories anymore. And I say privilege in in a positive way, is the fact that you are in a place where it doesn't it doesn't need to be part of your journey anymore to find strength in other people's coming out stories. Mm. And ultimately, I would love everybody to be in that place. But sadly, in the in the areas that we work, individuals, they need to hear out the coming out stories, particularly the positive coming out stories, because our coming out story, you know, with what happened to my fiancé Naz, that was a really tragic, tragic coming out story. But what I think people find comfort in is that we're now making a stand against those reasons and 
what we've found is a lot of people want to hear coming out stories that can empower them, that can inspire them, that can, that can, if they are, if they're already out themselves and they're in that place where they don't need to necessarily listen to other people's coming out stories, you know, maybe a coming out story can, instead of giving them the strength for them to continue, maybe it's going to give them the strength to inspire them to create change for other people who are now in, not in who are not in the same place that they are now. Yeah. Have you had any specific feedback for your film on specifically Muslim LGBT plus people have felt that empowerment? Because um, I could imagine it could make a lot of difference. But yeah. Yes, we've got, um, well, so far the film has been screened to a very limited audience. Um, but so far the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive because, um, you know, particularly from the contributors involved, because, you know, they got involved because they heard about Nazi's story and they didn't want the same thing happening to anyone else ever again. And I think the, I guess the, the kind of the nervous anxiety that, you know, the team have behind the film is, you know, when it goes out to a public audience, you know, how will they react? But I think what our goal with the film it's going to be well. It's going to be really important, and it goes out to a mainstream audience. But the film was made for that person who's in their bedroom, who can't speak to anyone, who doesn't have anyone to speak to, who perhaps thinks that they're only one from their religious background that exists who is LGBTQ or plus. So, our film is really talking to that person to show that the there is hope, and there is there there are some very difficult situation so you have to be cautious about coming out but at the same time there is a lot of positivity and hope um, and often it's the hope that myself included sometimes it's only the hope that we have that gets us through to the next day yeah I really enjoyed your film it's about very serious stories and issues but you achieve that balance of light and dark very well you've got on the one hand these serious stories and things that need to change but also you've got these upbeat characters inspiring your credits end with everyone's best joke <laughs> were you conscious throughout of keeping this balance and did it ever sort of knock out of kilter did did you get a final version where you thought no we need to I was there a certain amount of juggling involved I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking I think I mean definitely yes um the the, I mean, when when I was starting to imagine how the film might actually kind of uh, work out in terms of the the energy, so I um, a lot of the work I do, we focus on what's the what's the end feeling that we'd want somebody to have um, when they walk away from a talk or when they heard our story. What do we? What's that one thing? Because quite often individuals, um, when they watch a film or when they listen to someone speak, they they forget the words that we used they forget part of the story perhaps in fact they probably forget a lot of the story but what they don't forget is the feeling that they leave with and so by starting at the end which was we want people to feel uplifted hopeful um, positive um, even looking forward to a future we realize that you know each person we speak to we would have to you know, get them to a place as well where they were willing to tell jokes or, um, you know, find the yeah. jokes if they didn't have them. Um, so it was always, the film was always going to start off in the darkest place, which was with our story. Um, and then it was going to slowly move into a slightly more positive place and then hopefully in a really kind of uplifting um, kind of finale at the end. Um, because that's what, that's what Naz would have wanted. You know, he was a very happy person. He wouldn't want people, you know, feeling sad only about what happened. Yeah. And do you think you'd try and... Um, you were mentioning that you might um, want to do smaller films about, you know, go more in depth for all your contributors. Would you sort of bring the same energy to that? Is that basically your whole ethos with your charity as well? Is that basically how you define it? Yeah, yeah I think so. I think it's really important to to be able to understand the the emotions that we would like the audience to feel throughout the film. And I think um, 
you know, we would love to continue making the, you know, the smaller versions of the film for each each person. And I think it's important to keep to have parts of them that can be positive, if that's possible. Um, it might not always be the case, but I think it's really important to to be able to take the audience on a journey. I, because if you can take someone on a journey, if you can understand the the importance of what parts we need to communicate in each person's story, but then also allow someone to smile as well. I think that, for me, is a really powerful way of, of making a film. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it sounds like you're sort of developing your own style of how you want to make documentaries through, through all this making. That's really good. Um, yeah, you, so you have... You have a mixture of pieces in this film. You have, as you were saying, Sana's sort of spoken word piece, which is absolutely beautiful. And you've got these, um, but on the other hand, you follow, it's Manny, isn't it, in, in his kitchen. Yes. Um, and you've got, yeah, how did you go about putting this patchwork together? Like, you've got some beautiful filming in there too. Like, how did you mix art with sort of on fly on the wall, like, and form it all into a final piece? I think so my the way my mind works is is it's it's heavily influenced by by sound and music feeling and emotion and because we were starting off with our own story and you know sadly what happened to 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 Naz we we needed to move into a different place with um Kaleem and Manny and you know, we wanted those to be more, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like a cinema verite type thing where you follow an individual around. We wanted them to be more ex exploratory. Um, and actually, can you ask that again? Because I've completely forgot yeah, what you of asked. Course. I was, yeah, basically asking, so you record and you've got a poem from someone. Yes. You record and then you've got someone saying, who they what they'd like to cook for their future partner and things like that and how how do you decide the balance of that and how did you stitch it all together um as well as your own story it's sort of like lots of different things all coming into place but it's sort of made it's okay if you don't really have an answer because some these things just sometimes happen yeah. <laughs> like just the magic of you know putting a film together um but yeah i was just curious yeah so um because we knew we were going to start with our story, our very tragic story about losing Naz and sadly why why he took his own life. So we started off in the darkest place because we knew we wouldn't go, we couldn't go any darker after that. And so we knew we had to slowly build up. And when we filmed with Manny, so I think Manny, we we actually filmed... I think that was shot over three three or four different sessions, I think it was. Oh, okay. um, and the curry that um, Manny was cooking, he was actually cooking it for me because he wanted to teach me how to make a curry. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, um, you know, I, I really fell in love with Manny's perspective on the world because he, he talks about, um, in a very sad way, the kind of the, the kind of the, kind of the, the truth about we're, we're all getting old um, and we we were able to speak to Manny in a way that allowed him to open up about the extreme um, abuse well it's not even extreme abuse the fact that if he went back to his country of birth he has death threats against him and that's what we had to fight for um, because to be able to speak to someone about that and for that individual to still be able to talk about the beauty of love i think for me it was a real privilege to be on that journey with manny and after kind of following manny we really needed to get another voice who was in a similar situation that was kaleem to talk about his perspective of also coming from the same country as as manny and the, and also the prospects from his perspective of what could happen if he went back to his home country. But from there, it was really important then to go into a different um, space. 
and Misana's poem, and Madiwara's love, it was an incredible way of really taking everyone into a more beautiful, more kind of uh, a creative space where we could allow people to just lose themselves in watching that very slow motion shot of um, Sana um, staring at yeah, the camera and do slowly lose into yourself. I got tingles. Yeah, I rewatched that bit quite a lot. It's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. And what was really important about that was we started off uh, like an incredibly dark uh, black and white shot that slowly, as Sana's uh, words allowed us to get more. Um, positive you know the shots became more brighter and eventually as we went into the smile it became color it was almost mm -hmm. like a wizard of Oz moment where we wanted to take people from the darkness right. of the of the more darker stories into the more positive place where we could continue the rest of the film yeah that's that's brilliant get that magic in <laughs> um yeah i suppose you've mentioned that you start the film with um a bit of your story and you know it is very personal you've got on screen i met you know when i met naz and it's it's coming from you i was wondering how hard was the process of this was it did you ever lose heart in doing the film or was it sort of strong determination throughout because the goal was there yeah i guess i'm quite a stubborn person i never <laughs> i never lost sight of what we were trying to achieve and I certainly I can't take credit for imagining all of this I mean you know um, my producer Mira you know we worked as a team on this a close team um, and we bounced a lot of ideas off each other a lot of experiences um, so I guess what we really Sorry, I've forgotten the question again. Sorry. That's okay, don't worry. I told you it was my turn to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was basically asking in the process of this, um, were there ever moments where you just sort of lost heart in it and didn't really want to carry on with it? Or was it from the start always very determined? Yeah. From the start, it was always very determined because we wanted to have a version of our film ready um, for the 30th of July. Uh, 2019 so it was a very early version of it but we wanted to have a version ready for the more the memorial event for my late fiance Naz and so the the commitment was whatever it takes Deadline. a film in whatever description <laughs> is going to be screened whether it's bad or good it's going to be screened so that was really okay. the goal um, and what was really good about that was not only did we have a fixed date a fixed time we, you know, we hired out the Cinema Museum in London, so we already had committed to that event. That it, and because the event was so important, the date was so important. Remember, Naz, you know, I think it really focused all of our contributors uh, and also, you know, Mira myself as well. So we never lost sight of why we were doing it. And then after we had screened it on that event, what was really good about that, we were able to reflect on what worked, what didn't work, you know, where were the really bad rough edges? You know, is it really that noticeable, the audio quality? <laughs> is it really <laughs> noticeable that those are out of focus? <laughs> you know, and also we realized that there were, we needed a, we needed some more contributors. And when we started doing the filming or when we kind of get to, got to post-production, we'd committed to doing no more filming, but we hadn't come across, or we hadn't met all of the contributors that are now in the film. Okay. So we met some more contributors and we thought we have to get them in the film. So, you know, Armia and Armia, we, we didn't really know them at the beginning of the filming project. Um, and in Armia and Armia, we had to get them into the film. They're great. They bring a really light energy to it. Yeah, it's lovely. Yes. Yeah, so at the beginning of your film, you state a goal that you are doing this to understand if things could have been different, if there were more positive role models. Would you say you now understand or is this an ongoing thing you're learning? Has the film helped you learn anything? I think it's, I think it really, in many ways, it probably wasn't a question for me, even if it was worded that way, because really okay. the, I think the question will be answered when individuals in a similar situation to Naz have been able to watch the film 
and slowly we hope that you know you know my god i'm queer volume one you know we would like to do a volume two and a three and explore stories even more in greater detail um because i think it's really important that we have these conversations in public and that particular scene at the beginning of the film where i'm being interviewed in black and white that wasn't in the original cut we hadn't even filmed that at all it was the last thing i wanted to do was be in the film because the film was not about naz and i we were just the starting point and i did everything i possibly could to not be in the film because it wasn't it wasn't although our story started it the film isn't my story it's the stories the stories of the community we you know we were making it for and i did everything i could not to be in there but then one real advantage of having an early version of the film which you could show to people was that we could show it to people to get feedback um you know like mira showed it to producers that she knew and right. the overwhelming feedback that came back was from individuals who never heard of our story was where's matt i mean all you see is the back of his head <laughs> so you need to be in it and i said i don't want to be in it and mira said like i'm coming down i'm coming all the way down to your house the camera's going to stay there we're going to put the lighting on <laughs> no and i'm not like, leaving <laughs> until we've filmed something with you and okay. the reaction you see of me frustrated in front of the camera was because i didn't know how to articulate the reason why i was making the film because i knew why i was making the film i knew why i had to make the film i knew the message of the film but until that filmed interview with me i had never had to articulate it in a way that was um digestible in a way because all of the contributors we worked with they knew i was making the film i didn't have to explain it to them right because yeah. they knew the story i mean you now got very um practiced at articulating this message <laughs> i imagine especially for your charity um for those who don't know could you let us know what the naz and matt foundation does Yes, of course. Yeah. So Nazamat Foundation, we were a registered charity and we were set up in 2014, sadly as a result of my fiancé Naz taking his own life two days after being confronted about being gay for the first time by his deeply religious um, parents. The charity started, uh, or rather the idea for the charity came a few days after Naz passed away because I was about to take my own life. I was about to follow Naz in exactly the same way that he had gone. And at the moment when I was about to do the act, his voice, um, I heard his voice. Not like that voice in the back of your head like we all have, but this commanding voice that said, Matt, darling, I need to give you a reason to stay. And I want to ask you to do this. And I know you always did everything I ever asked of you. So if I ask you to do this, I know you'll do it and you'll stay. And he said, Matt, I want you to... I want you to set up something, a group or a foundation or something that's going to help people in our situation. And as his voice disappeared, instead of climbing, instead of following Naz in the same way that he had taken his own life, I went back into the flat, I locked the door, and I sat on the floor and I cried. And that, that one moment, hearing Naz's voice, it saved my life. And now that is the foundation of everything we do at the Nazimat Foundation. We, we go into schools, colleges, universities, we work with um, families, we work with central government now, we, we talk about the impact of being LGBTQ plus and living within a conservative religious family and what can be done to try and stop more young people taking their own life when their parents don't accept them. And so this, our film is really an extension of of that that work and i hope that when people watch my god i'm queer they will see that there is positivity ahead and they will see that there can be a bright future ahead but they can also see the the harsh reality that some people do face in their lives because of their own parents yeah do you do you find that there are increasing amounts of role models, Muslim LGBT uh, plus role models. Is it is it getting getting better? And who are some of your favorite role models right now? Yeah, I couldn't possibly pick a favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. We just, <laughs> we just want to let them know. Um, yeah, just some of your favorites. 
Well, I would say when before Naz passed away, I I can't recall seeing um, I can't recall seeing a queer Muslim in the press in the media sharing their story publicly. Yes, of course, there there will have been some, but I certainly mm. didn't see them in any of the press and the media that I was um, coming across. And and I don't think Naz did either because we would have we would have talked about it. Right. But since Naz passed away, um, there's been a there's been a, a growing number of LGBTQ plus Muslims who are speaking out in the press, in the media, um, reading poetry, you know, on Channel 4, on the BBC, mm -hmm. um, you know, performing at large Channel concerts. 4, Channel 4 2015 document, was it 2015? Yeah, which was the Muslim drag queens one and things like that. Yes. That, yeah. And I think that so was... it's a, all been increasing since exactly. around that time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And there, there are different support groups, um, you know, there's Hadaya and Iman, they both support LGBTQ plus Muslims. And of course, our own charity as well. So it's, it's. I think what's helping is when you see somebody else who you can identify with and you can see that they have strength, I think part of that strength is then given to or felt by the person watching. So it's really important the more people from a similar background to speak out if it's safe to do so, to share stories um, and just to be themselves and I think our the brief that we gave to all of our contributors was that well, first of all we want to we want to we want to hear your story we want to ask you all those questions that probably you don't want us to ask you but we want to ask you the questions and you can say no afterwards but we also want to film you doing something normal and by normal I mean normal I mean like Fahan you know, we said, what's your normal thing? What would you normally do when you weren't talking about, um, you know, uh, being a queen Muslim? You know, what would you do when you mm. weren't marching at the front of um, Birmingham Pride? You know, what would you do? You say, I'd work on my car. I'd say, can we come round and film you working on your car? That was great. That Yeah, <laughs> things like that, they do add the character to it. Yeah, and yeah, don't need to be on on show 24-7 and be doing your job as such. Yeah, it's really good to as you say, just see normal lives happening. Um, and yeah, it's, it's that thing, isn't it? The more people can show being themselves, it's, it, yeah, it encourages everyone else to be themselves too. Yeah, yes. I, it's definitely, can definitely I, can agree. I, can I say one thing? One, one, one event that really accelerated the, um, the energy that we're putting into the film. Uh, last year in Birmingham, there were, you may have seen the work, uh, protests from parents, religious parents, outside the gates of primary schools because they're protesting against um, LGBT lettons being introduced into the schools. Okay, I, I didn't actually, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. It was a really big thing. So Birmingham is our home city, and as a mine, I'm home city. We're both from there. We both left the area where these protests were starting to happen. And <clears throat> we were, we had started filming for the documentary but then Mira, my producer, she, she's very good at, this is a really good producer who can get inside knowledge about anything. So she got some inside knowledge about the protests and she said, do you want me to go? And I was, I was scared about going to the protests initially myself. And I said, well, if you don't mind going, she says, yeah, I'll go. I'll change my name, I'll cover my face, I'll take good a phone, I'll do audio recordings, I'll do video recordings, I'll do whatever you want. And I said, look, you go. But if it's, you know, it's not safe, then come back or don't go. Yeah. And off she went. And some of the stuff that she came back with really affected me in a really negative way. And in a really, it made me feel really worried. Um, and I, I still can't even describe the feeling that I had listening to the videos or watching the videos that were I saw from that those protests that day. Because it made me scared. And if... As a more mature person who's who's who should have more life experience, who's who has a lot more um, reasons to be strong about this, how would somebody else feel who was queer and from the same religious background? How would they feel walking down the streets when there's angry protesters saying, "You know, you can't be gay Muslim." 
That's essentially saying to someone they can't exist. And imagine if my Naz was young enough and had been walking down the streets, then I feared what he would have felt if he had to walk past those people, being angry and on loudspeakers telling him he can't exist. And that, in many ways, accelerated the, the effort I wanted to put in the film because it got me, um, it, got, it just got me very worried inside and something needed to be done to challenge it. And although our film isn't a direct challenge to that, it's a challenge to that ideology that you can't be LGBT plus and from a certain religion because of course you can because you're born the way that you are. Yeah. Do you have any ideas or seen anything work for, on a smaller scale, communities to increase that awareness and acceptance of LGBT plus people from certain religious backgrounds? Is there things that people can be doing in their community? For example, when protests are going on, what can be done? Yeah. Well, those um, those particular protests in Birmingham, there was there was quite a big thing done. There was an organisation called Seeds that was set up, which directly challenged um, those negative narratives. And not with counter protests, because the whole um, the whole idea of protesting outside a primary school is wrong. So, the LGBT community and um, Seeds and other organisations, you know, they collectively agreed not to protest in the streets out of primary schools because okay. that would make them as bad not as bad but it would make the act of protest outside of a school somehow acceptable which it's not so but what can be done is i mean is you know films like my god i'm queer can be shown in communities you know people can share their stories which they do and a lot of work is going on you know our charity is just one of you know several charities that that work in this area and it comes back to sharing stories is the most powerful way of communicating the impact of what it's like to not be accepted by your own parents because if, you know imagine if you went into a school or community center and you've just got some statistics you just got some random facts you just got some random ideas about why it's not a good idea to not accept your kids it's only going to get you so far but if you can go into those same situations with real stories from real people that they can connect to and see actually oh my God, that's actually a bit like someone in my family or I can identify with that person. Stories and storytelling are one of the most important tools that we as humans have to be able to communicate ideas and to bring change. Nice. Just going to check how... M I forgot to put on a timer. How are we for time? Hmm? About now. Okay, I'll ask the final question. <coughs> um... Yeah, I suppose it's one of my final questions. Um, what is the main piece of advice you'd give to filmmakers who, similar to yourself, felt they have a story to tell, possibly quite difficult or possibly quite controversial, how to tackle the project? What's the advice you'd give? My advice to a filmmaker or someone who wants to be a filmmaker and needs to tackle a particular difficult topic is to either find in yourself a personal connection to that topic or to find someone who does have that connection, that personal connection, who you can work very closely with to start the process of thinking through why you're making this film. Because sometimes if you're an external observer to a particular situation, you might never be able to explore it to the levels that it needs to compared to somebody who is either from that situation or at least has first-hand experience of that situation. Second thing is just get your camera out and start filming stuff, even if it's nothing to do with the film, but just start getting used to having a camera in your hand. And I'd say the third thing, and find yourself a producer. Find yourself a producer who also wants the same as you because I think my personal experience was that yes, I can edit, yes, I can go and shoot, yes, I can go and meet people and interview them, but sometimes what you need is 
the energy and the inspiration from somebody who's not yourself. And somebody, sometimes you just need someone who's really good at nagging you, just to get you up, just to get you in the right place and to get you in the mindset. And somebody who, when your energy starts to drop, you know, their energy will continue to take you forward. And I think sometimes it's easy to overlook the importance of a producer, but having a producer on board who is an in, intrinsic part of the project, I think is really important. Yeah, share the load. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, my final question is that so everyone's watching Iris this year from their homes, maybe in small groups, maybe with their nan. Do you have any advice for making a home cinema? Like what would your snacks be? How should you set up your room? How do you get into the film watching mood? Uh, dark in the room, uh, get some loudspeakers, find the biggest TV or projector you can get your hands on. Um, Snack wise, no Doritos, they're too noisy. No oh, popcorn, really? oh. too noisy. Oh, fair. Soup with a straw would be better. <laughs> Soup with a straw, okay. I mean, you usually can't do that in normal cinemas, so that's pretty good. Okay. Soup I think the important straw. thing is just allow people to, to get absorbed by what they're watching. I think, um, I think that probably the most annoying thing is when people ask you questions, when you're trying to figure it out yourself. Yeah. And I, I think, have friends like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think just let, I mean, with 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 our film, I really just you know we, we really hoped that we could take people on a journey of of, of different emotions, but a journey of a, of a story and something that you could feel just um, you know absorbed by. Yeah, well, it definitely achieves that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. This has been an Iris Prize podcast. I'm Lucy Smith and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and tune in next time.